Hi, I'm Tiffany Cohen, 1996 International Swimming Hall of Fame Honor Swimmer and 1984 two-time Olympic gold medalist. March is Women's History Month and the International Swimming Hall of Fame is celebrating by bringing you the history of women in competitive swimming. 100 years ago, there was no competitive swimming for women. In fact, in those days, it was unusual for women to participate in any type of athletic activity or any activity outside of the house, for that matter. A woman's place was in the home, and it had been that way since at least the fall of Rome. Women, like men, have been swimming since the dawn of time. But after the fall of the Roman Empire, when nudity and bathing were deemed sinful, women were kept out of the water for over a thousand years. European men started swimming again during the age of exploration, but it took Benjamin Franklin to get women back in the water. Legend has it that after Ben wrote letters to friends about the wonders of swimming, a French countess threw herself in the water fully clothed, and that's how women entered the water for the next 150 years fully clothed. In America, it took the horrible boating tragedy in which a thousand women drowned in the East River of New York City and an Australian swimmer to do away with the full body bathing costumes that characterized the 19th century and into suits women could swim in. It was 1907 when Annette Kellerman tried to bring her Diving Venus Act to Boston. Because she wore a one-piece man swimming suit, she was arrested for indecent exposure. A girl can't swim in more clothes than you can hang on a clothesline, she said. How many women have to drown when men aren't around to save them before you allow us to wear a swimsuit in which we can learn to swim, she asked the judge. None, he said, and the rest, as they say, is history. Annette Kellerman went on to become Broadway and Hollywood's biggest star. She changed the way women thought of themselves and the way they dressed, and she got girls out of the house and into the pool. In large part, Annette was responsible for the swimming pool craze of the 1920s, when every city of 1,500 or more had to have a pool where athletic girls paraded around in their swimsuits. In 1926, Gertrude Ederly struck another blow for women's rights when she became the first woman to swim across the English Channel and beat the best men's time by over two hours. She proved once and for all that women could do physically strenuous activities equal or even better than men. Swimming played another important role in the women's rights movement when Donna Deverona wondered why Don Scholander was able to swim in college and she couldn't after the 1964 Olympic Games. After all, they were both from the same high school, swam for the same coach, and both won Olympic gold medals. The only difference was that he was a man and she was a woman, and there were men's varsity programs, but none for women. It was this clear contract that helped convince Congress to pass Title IX and open the path for all girl athletes to participate in high school and college. Here we are at the International Swimming Hall of Fame with a display of swimsuits for the history of competitive swimming. And we start out with, in about 1906, just a change of the century, this is actually a bathing costume that women had to wear. As we see down here, we've got the stockings, the bloomers, and this was another part of the swimsuit, long sleeve and bathing cap. Imagine having to compete in, that, in this kind of costume, but it, they did not compete, they were just in bathing pools. And this is the suit that replaced the swimming costume from 1906. In 1907, Annette Kellerman introduced this to the public and it was very risque. As you see, the arms are exposed. And it's not as bulky and baggy as the other one. And she had the suit introduced in 1907. It was worn with stockings until 1919 when Charlotte Boyle introduced this suit and won the right for women not to have to wear stockings and Charlotte Boyle won gold medals in 1920. In this next series of suits, we have some of the suits worn by some of the most famous women in aquatics history. Here we have the first two-piece suit worn by Gertrude Ederly when she swam across the English Channel. Over here, we have a one-piece bathing suit worn in 1937 by Eleanor Holm 
and she wore this in the Billy Rose Aquacade. And this third suit was worn in 1942 by Esther Williams, and she wore this in her film debut in Andy Hardy's Double Life. Look at this outrageous suit. Now, this is a little bit later when the two-piece suit actually became more in fashion, but bikinis were many years later. And in 1960, this was the last year that women had to wear a black suit to compete in. Donna Devarona actually wore this suit when she was in the 1960 Olympics. In 1964, FINA allowed color suits for the very first time. This suit here was worn by one of the greatest swimmers of all time, Don Frazier of Australia. Okay. In the 1970s and 80s, FINA did away with the modesty skirt that dated back to the very first suit that we saw. This Lycra suit was worn by Karen Matuchik of East Germany. And now we have the full body suit made of Faskin, worn by modern champions of our time like Natalie Coughlin. So, as you can see, in 100 years, we've come a long way. We've gone from suits that are made of wool, nylon, Lycra, and silk, and even now, Faskin. We've gone from a full body cover up to something skimpy, and now back to a full body cover up again. Wouldn't Annette Kellerman be comfortable with seeing the woman in our time on a pool deck wearing something like this? Thank you very much for joining me today. I'm Tiffany Cohen here at the International Swimming Hall of Fame.